Good morning and welcome to Denver Celebration. My name is Carrie Herzog and I get to be your host for today's production. We are so excited for the subject we're going to talk about today and it is vital to our relationship with Jesus and that is worship. When you think about worship, it's one of the things that we will be doing in heaven that we can also do here on earth. And that's why it's so important that we know how to worship him in spirit and truth. That's what the word says, that we are supposed to worship him in spirit and truth. And we're going to talk about how we do that today. We have a very special guest with us all the way from Florida. I am going to read you his bio to let you know a little bit about him. His name is Jim Wingerter. He is the minister of music at Fellowship Church and he has been at that position uh, since 1994. He leads praise and worship for the congregation and directs adult and children's singing groups as well as instrumental groups. He also composes, orchestrates, and records new songs for his ministry and worship. He earned his undergraduate degree from the Florida State University College of Music. He also has extensive experience as a professional singer, having performed leading roles in numerous Broadway productions and also operas. He is also a highly respected as a high school choral music director. He is a busy man, and he is here with us to visit. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Honor to be here. Thank you. You, uh, amongst all of your, your pursuits, you have taken the time to write a book. I, I have. I don't know how you have done that, <laughs> but it is about worship, and we're going to talk about that today. Share with me how that came to be, how you, you added author to your list. Yeah, uh, well... Uh, the worship experience, uh, I believe, begins with a lot of us, um, probably with all of us, uh, as the Lord plants seeds, mm -hmm. things happen as you go through life mm -hmm. and it develops more and more. The book itself was, uh, was a product of, uh, with my congregation, I share with them mm -hmm. uh, some, uh, so occasionally on worship and we talk about it mm -hmm. uh, so that there's, uh, it's important for them all to understand. Yeah. Everyone in the body needs to understand the goal uh, and in a lot of churches there isn't a goal, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Well, that's what we're going to share today, specifically are all of those things that, uh, that uh, have been developing over all of these years. So, and, and I know you told me earlier that you have something in this book that you felt like no one else, at least that you knew of, had kind of discovered or realized. If so, they've discovered it, they haven't written it down yet. So, Well, then you beat them to it. So tell us what that is. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a number of things. Uh, I think we want to begin, first of all, with, uh, and we have a chart that we can share with you, uh, the, the diagrams, um, uh, that if we're going to begin with the tabernacle of Moses. It's not really <laughs> Moses' tabernacle. Yes. God instructed him to build it. Mm -hmm. And there's a layout there that needs to be seen. There's an approach to God that's demonstrated here. A person would bring, uh, especially if they recognize that they had committed a sin, they would bring an offering to the gate, which is uh, shown graphically on the bottom. Mm -hmm. A priest would meet them in that posture. They actually didn't go into the tent complex. Mm -hmm. they, uh, the priest received the offering, brought it to the altar, a burnt offering, and sacrificed it there. Uh, and then if the priest was going to minister within the tent, he would wash in the water laver, and then he would be free to enter into the holy place. Now, there's a phenomenon here. Many people are probably familiar with this. The holy place actually is a representation of Jesus or Yeshua. And so when you look at that, you see that there's a menorah, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Mm. And there's a table of showbread, and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Yes. And he was born in Bethlehem, which is also in Hebrew, Beit Lachem, which means the bread of life, mm. or house of bread. Yes. And then... Uh, there's a table for the burning of incense. Uh, uh, when um, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, was in the temple doing his duty, he was standing there between the table of incense and the table of showbread, uh, and he, he, he heard from the angel there that he was going to have a son. Wow. So that's where that took place. And uh, the scripture tells us that we have one intercessor who is the Messiah, Jesus. Mm. Now on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, a priest once a year would pass through the curtain that you see there and directly before the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the throne of God in the earth. We know that when Moses built all of this and put everything in its place, the whole area filled up with smoke and everybody had to bow out of there because they couldn't stand in the presence of it. Uh, it was so powerful. The problem with that, because, and it's not really a problem, that's what God gave Israel to do. Okay. But 
uh, uh, that's a directive given to Aaron and passed down to the priesthood as long as that endured in Israel. But we see in the early church, uh, at least around 200s to 300s AD, that they appear to be modeling after what is done in the synagogue. And if you go into a synagogue today uh, and you sit in on a service, it's very similar to what happens in many churches. And so it's evident that they picked that up from there, but I would suggest uh, strongly that the early church, the first century church, perhaps extending into the second century as well, genuinely worshiped in a different fashion. And we see often Jesus and in some of the writings of Paul that there's a focus on uh, David and uh, scriptural statements that, that uh, were made by David that point directly to Jesus. And the focus, the co focus keeps going to David. Yes. So if you look at David carefully, and we got to get beyond uh, Bathsheba. <laughs> yes. Most people, you say David, well, he slew Goliath, and he had, a, he had an affair with Bathsheba, and he killed her husband. Isn't how yeah. we, that how we are today? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we label them with their sins, not right. with their, exactly. what they do for the Lord. David is a powerful prophetic picture of Jesus. Mm. But we have to look at some other attributes of his life to see that. So we get a covenant, uh, actually, with David that ends up being the covenant that we have in Jesus, and it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, but David determines, uh, and, and it had to have been a word from the Lord. The scripture doesn't say that the Lord spoke to him and said, get the, get the uh, Ark of the Covenant and bring it to, bring it to yourself in Jerusalem. But uh, the ark had been returned without going into a whole lot of the historical detail of what took place there. The Philistines had the ark. Yes. Uh, it was returned to Israel, uh, and it got kept in the house of a priest for a time hmm. because nobody really knew what to do with it. And it, it, to me, it would have been simple, just take the thing back to the tent that Moses built. That's where, right. that's where it came from. Right. But for some reason, they left it in the house of this priest. And, and uh, evidently, David felt that the Lord had told him, bring that thing to yourself in Jerusalem. And he, he embarked on doing that, and he did the same thing that the Philistines had done, which was to put that ark on a cart that was drawn by oxen. Yes. Well, that, that's not the way God said that should be done. And so uh, the, the cart teetered, and the ark was about to fall off of it, and Uzzah must have been a little uh, arrogant or something, but he grabbed a hold of the ark to steady it, yes. and Uzzah was struck down. I remember that story. And he died. I do. So um, David was extremely upset yeah. that that had happened. Well, yeah. And I, so, I, I'm <laughs> right, not touching it right. Now. <laughs> so uh, he goes back to Jerusalem and, and he's scratching his head. What did I do wrong here? Yeah. And uh, so he goes through the scripture and he reads <laughs> that the Levites are supposed to be carrying. And he said, you know what? I'm not supposed to be doing this my way. I'm supposed to be doing this God's way. Isn't that true about our lives? I was just going to say there's a message right, right there. There's a for huge all message this. right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, David, David then uh, embarks again on bringing the ark to himself in Jerusalem, this time carried by the Levites, mm. which is the prescribed method. And so uh, every six steps they take, they stop and make a sacrifice. Every and six steps. Every six steps. Wow, that must so, have taken a long time. <laughs> I think a herd in the process oh, as well. Wow, uh, goodness. So you would say, well, why did he feel yeah. like he had to make a sacrifice every six steps? And I believe it's because the, he kept going back to the Lord going, is this exactly what you want me to do? Mm. And, and uh, the reason that he would be doing that, for folks that have been to Israel, if you've gone to the, to the uh, tomb of Samuel, mm -hmm. it's in Gibeon, which is... Uh, Samuel had moved the tabernacle from Shiloh over to Gibeon. And so it's, it's just about 10 miles north of Jerusalem. It's yeah, right there. Sure. So as David is bringing the thing into Jerusalem, it would have been really easy to just turn off to the left, the, the northeast a little bit, and, and send that thing up to Gibeon to the place where it was built to you be. You would have thought it was the logical right, place. Right. So every six steps he's going, I'm making sure, mm. I'm making sure that I'm, I'm going with that cloud yes. before me and the pillar of fire that, mm. that Israel experienced. And in the Holy Spirit, we all should do that every day. And, and so he was checking and double checking and triple checking, it, yes, this, is, this is what I am to do. Yep. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a tent that David sets up and it's separate from the tent, the tabernacle, same, same, same thing, that's in Gibeon. And David's tent lacks, now we have a graphic of that also. Okay, let's so look David's, at that. Te David's tent is just a big room. Hmm. And there's no candelabra in there. No. 
there's and okay and again that's that's a representation of I am the light of the world there's yes. no table of showbread a representation of the bread of life there's no table um, altar of incense yeah. that we have one intercessor who is the Messiah it's just a room no, no dividing curtain. Curtain. No curtain right there's the Ark of the Covenant and mm. evidently and we see clearly in, in, even in Psalm 51 when David repents of his relationship mm -hmm. with uh, Bathsheba yeah. uh, he goes into the tent right before the ark there's no dividing curtain it's just him and God right there and he's laying it down and it seems evident that not just the Levites uh, which which were scheduled to go in there on a regular basis right. and constantly be bringing up praise and worship before the Lord but in addition to the Levites uh, anybody could go in and out freely this is critical because David mm. is this awesome picture of prophecy of Jesus to come David is functioning as the intercessor, and that's why the people, the people of Israel are to able to come and go uh, right before the presence of God. When David died, everything shuts down. Uh, Solomon builds the stone yeah. temple. The furniture that was uh, in, the other in the other tent was yep. moved in, and, and, uh, and, and everything goes back to the way it had been before. Where they couldn't come and go freely. Right, exactly, wow. exactly. So there's just this time of David that we get this prophetic picture. Mm -hmm. So if we look at what a church should be, <laughs> mm. 